I'm really sorry I'm late, but I, they wouldn't let me fly the plane. Um, the, the flight was delayed from 8.30 to 9.30 and then it took off at 5 past 10. So, um, thank you for staying, Jenny. Um, I know you're all very busy. Uh, so, five minutes, quick presentation. Some of you guys have seen this presentation before. Um, so it's going to be really boring. Uh, but it will give you an idea of do something, yeah. Um, ah, that's it. So some of you guys have seen this presentation before, it's five minutes, but it'll give you an idea of what the hell I'm talking about. Um, my name's John, John Bradford. If you want to get me, at JD, and I'll follow you. And if you DM me to your heart's content. And if you're reading stuff, I'll stop following you. Um, my background is for my sins, I'm an accountant. Uh, I used to run something called the Difference Engine. They thought it was so great, some angel investors came and gave me some money. That's what it was called. Um, to build the Difference Engine, I was really fortunate. I happened to buy a weird series of coincidental events, ended up being the guy who ran Techstars, a guy called David Cohen. And after 10 minutes, he said, that's really cool, can I do something to help you? And he helped me set up the Difference Engine, which was based in the northeast of England, which currently is in the middle of nowhere, relatively speaking, in the UK. But what was really interesting is it worked, and it worked, what does work mean? Five of the nine teams that took part in that program got follow-on funding, and one's bootstrapping, so six out of nine are still in existence. One in Silicon Valley, Three raised about ten thousand pounds, and one's just finished closing around for three quarters of a million. So it really does help. Oh, I'm going to go back. From that, I had a bunch of angels come to me and say, "That's really cool, but imagine you could do this, and you could do this in somewhere interesting, like Cambridge." And actually, the other thing is, which is a bit interesting, is originally the Difference Engine was funded completely by the public sector. So they wrote me a big check, which is great. <laughs> but the difference between Springboard and the difference engine ultimately is, I've got 10 angels. The 10 angels don't bring me just money, but they help me in terms of advice. And they also bring their own personal network. <coughs> and that is massively beneficial for me. So I sit there and go, I really need to speak to somebody here. I've got 10 of them sit there and go, I can do that. And that's where this becomes really, really interesting. Um, I also personally think, having run in the North East of England, that you can run it anywhere. Absolutely anywhere. I genuinely think these things are massively beneficial. And where I can help people set things like this up, I will. I genuinely think it's not, this shouldn't, shouldn't be an exclusive club. This should be something which is part of every ecosystem across Europe. People don't complain about having too many incubators. And people don't complain about having too many venture capitals. They don't complain about too many agents because you can't really find them. But I see this as a natural part of the world evolution. So what is this thing? This thing is a 13-week boot camp, full-time, in situ. See, we're very fortunate in the middle of Cambridge University. Uh, the best part is we don't have to do academics. But the great part is that actually we have all the infrastructure that sits around Cambridge University. So I have access to their accommodation systems, access to their infrastructure. So we've got something like that 40 gig download capability. So it's great for important. Um, so what are we aimed at? Typically it's digital businesses. But it's actually beyond digital businesses. The thing that's really interesting in the way I now describe it is we're interested in scalable businesses. Sometimes those will be internet, sometimes those may be desktop software type things, and sometimes they may be a bit of hardware in there as well. Actually, hardware I think is really interesting in Cambridge because of the background there. There's kind of ARM, and there's uh, Silicon, uh, Cambridge Silicon Radio. So there's lots of expertise in hardware as well. What do we do? We give people a little bit of money, but actually it's the least important part of the process. We give people £5,000 per founder, but it's really only there to keep you alive for the duration of the program. But that actually having money in your pocket so that you can concentrate on your business is really, really important. 
Um, the thing which we actually think is a real value add is this stuff. Support log. Well, not quite like that. Um, what we actually do is, it's all about the mentors. It's all about providing you with the support, the network, the guidance, the contacts. At a very, very early stage, I personally believe that writing a bigger check doesn't make you better and faster. The thing that makes you better faster is plugging yourself into a bigger network and getting people who've been there and done it before. The program's aimed at people who do stuff. So if you come to me and say, look, it's a really cool idea. Give me some money and I go on the program. I go and fuck off. Sorry. You'll have to do a lot of believe you the video. Um, <coughs> I'm not interested. I'm interested in people who are up to the eyeballs, who are committed to what they're doing. It's the kind of the reason why I use this is to get people proud fail using the impression, which is entrepreneurs do stuff. Yeah? They don't write business plans. They don't do pitches. They get along. They get stuck in and they start building stuff. That's the people who I can see are committed to the process. The other thing that's really interesting is they're ambitious. So I actually define entrepreneurs as being a subset of startups. Every, there's lots of startups, but actually there's only a very few number of people who are in startups who are entrepreneurial. And the thing which I find is the whole process is a bit like group therapy for entrepreneurs. Yeah? Entrepreneurs are weird people. And actually most people say, why do you not get a real job? <laughs> um, I go back. And actually when you're in a room full of people who are actually have the same ambition, that you have, it's inspiring. It really is inspiring. That's what's common between all my teams. You walk in on the first day, and this is it's, it's amazing. People just go straight up and say, Hi, I'm, I'm doing this, what are you doing? And you suddenly got a common language. It really, really is profoundly interesting. And actually, it's not ambition in a competitive, I'm going to do better than you. But it's everybody wants everybody to do better. And actually, one of the things I do is when I select my teams, I try to avoid people who are competitive with each other. I'm actually interested in making sure that when there's 10 teams in a room, there's nobody that's going to go, well, I'm in the exact same space as he is. And therefore, actually, I won't be able to tell him some of the stuff that I'm doing. I can actually sit there and go, actually, I want to get the best of these two teams, and I don't have that guy. And I genuinely try to create an environment where people actually really help each other. Technology is sort of interesting, but actually to, to agree, I expect that most of the people in the room that I'm working with, technology is the least important part because they're actually pretty good at it. I can support that, so I've got all the big corporates come along and help. So the classic Google, Microsoft, PayPal, Amazon, Adobe, Mozilla, actually which is pretty cool, coming along. And they can help from a technical perspective. So the big thing I always say to people is, I get you to guys to come and speak to Google. Actually, you know when you get that problem with Google Maps, you go, where's the help desk number? And it doesn't exist. You know already know the people in Google. So actually creating that is really important. But this is the stuff that's really, really important. It's actually what I call go to market. It's all the business stuff, which is actually the fundamentally the interesting stuff. Because you're actually dealing with entrepreneurs who've been there and understand what it is, the pain of the process of trying to sell a product and who you want to sell it to. Why is it in Cambridge rather than London? Because of that. Because the thing about London is it's fantastically exciting to be there. But every day of the week, there's about five events going on. And by people's very nature, they feel they have to attend absolutely everything that's going on. Because they might miss something. And what we say is for 13 weeks, don't worry about that. We're going to hold a network event for you. The biggest one you'll ever see. And they're all coming to see you. So anybody that's interesting in the UK will come and see you. You don't have to go anywhere else. It's all about, did I answer the slide there? No. It's all about teams. So I apologize now. I really, I'd love to be able to help single finder businesses, but the program's not structured for that. The, the program is designed to help teams. The other reason I say that is you can't persuade somebody else to join you. Why the hell should I write you a check? So actually there's a whole dynamic around two people, which is actually more interesting than one person. Sounds strange, that sounds. 
Um, and you have to be open-minded. Actually, you don't have to be, because by the end of day three, you will be. What actually practically happens is, you suddenly realize all of these people are going to come along and give you guidance. And you suddenly go, do you know that bit that you're always protective of your business? And you say, no but, no but. You get really bored of saying that. And when you've got like 75, 200 people talking, you actually just sit there and listen. And one actually the mentor said to me, the nicest thing is actually people listen to your advice. And this is the bit that really helps. So I talk about mentors, what do they do? So mentors are typically experienced entrepreneurs or venture capitalists. And they've been there before. So the thing that I always say to people is they'll sit there and go, you know, I did that for six months and that was a complete waste of my time. You just don't want to do that. Yeah? And actually you think, oh, that's sort of interesting. And then the next person says exactly the same thing and suddenly it comes around and around. The thing that's massively exciting is you're not speaking to the 100 mentors. You speak to the 100 mentors and their contacts. So the classic thing I say is you'll sit there and you'll be talking to a mentor and he'll go, I know somebody you should be speaking to. And they'll make the introduction. So it's not just the 100. You're actually talking about a thousand, more than a thousand people you could potentially contact with, uh, talking to. And it's bloody exhausting. And people say, I used to think it was really hard work. I used to thought I, I used to work on hours. But they have no conception of what this looks like. It's, it's sort of like doing two days in one. So you kind of do a day with the mentors, and then you try and pick up the pieces and do the stuff that you meant to do during the day in the evening, and prepare yourself for the next day for the next set of mentors. And actually spending a day just selling your product and getting your advice is just exhausting, because your head hurts, genuinely hurts. And it's massively scary and fun at the same time. <coughs> you kind of go through these massive, so I've just, I'm in the middle of finishing up a different engine. Massive amounts of mood swings. People go from, this is fantastic, I've had a really good day, to the next day you go, everybody hates my product. What am I going to do? But if you can see everybody kind of going through this massive roller coaster. The interesting thing is the whole model is based on karma. It's all about people helping you and actually you helping them understand what's coming up in the future. And they're all doing it for free. That's the really cool part. So whilst it costs money to do the program, it costs money to do the program, the essential ingredient is this stuff. And there is a massive feedback loop in this process. Sometimes mentors become members of teams. Sometimes teams become mentors. But it builds you into that way that's quite very interesting. Open night, closing applications in the toilet. That's it. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Questions? You can run out of the room. I have a couple. Yes. Um, in what markets uh, are the angels that are going to be there active? Uh, what markets? There are so many of them, it doesn't matter. So, so I kind of cheat. There's a bit of, in theory I could sit down and I could say, I know what you're doing and I actually know what you're doing. So in theory these are the 15 people out of all of my mentors used to speak to. Actually I cheat, I don't do that because that's too much of hard work for you. Yeah. So what I actually do is I say, I can meet all 100. Yeah. Because actually there's 15 that are really valuable, I think. But there's a whole bunch of other people but I don't know all of their life experiences, and I don't know all of the contacts, and somewhere in the system that might happen. And angels are big VCs are exactly it. So the thing that I found with my VCs is my VCs they just basically can I come and help? I've just got more of them coming up than I able to do. So are they need more B2B, more B2C? There are just so many of them. It's not an issue. So on the investor day, I would expect to have between up to about 50 angels and VCs in the room. And what you're doing at that point is you're pitching and saying, hello, I'm here, do you want to speak to me? This is my cool product. So you never try to get the check written on the investor day. It's more an introductory session. And what you find is there'll be a whole bunch. It's really funny on the investor day because actually people who are really interested in you don't really talk to you. 
So all of what happens is the VC is kind of going, can I have a car? Because they don't want to be seen to be too interested in you because there's another VC standing behind them. And if they shoot, if you kind of go, oh, you're really cool, that suddenly I'll actually have all these VCs. Go, oh, is he? <laughs> so it's a really good really idea. So don't worry about that. The numbers game works here. Really well. When you refer about uh, scalability, you're talking about companies that play in one billion market, <coughs> one million market, and ten million markets, or no, it's more to do with uh, if you want to double the size of your business, you don't have to double the number of people in your business. Okay, so it's basically something where the costs are not uh, are starting to. <coughs> um, we have a number of my angels are bootstrap businesses. So actually, as I described this morning, one of my angels has bootstrapped his business to twenty five million dollars. So it's kind of bootstrapping at the extreme, um, and he's really genuinely interested in trying to help some businesses through the process. To say, you know what? You don't need venture capital in some instances. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. But there's also a really weird dynamic, which is the longer you can bootstrap, the more likely you get to profitability. The more likely you're actually going to get investors come to you. One of my teams, one of my mentors, has had that experience. So a year ago, they made a decision within the business to say, "Fuck the VCs, we're going to do this ourselves." Yeah. And if we can make ten million dollars out of this business, that's fine. <coughs> And actually, as soon as they went cash flow positive about six weeks ago, the phone started bringing them VCs. Yeah. So, so I think don't get fixated by whether you're raising money or you're not raising money. Get fixated by having a business model and kind of build something around it, and the other will fall. Uh, can you give uh, a picture in terms of uh, living expenses in Cambridge? I understand that accommodation is going to be uh, covered by the university. Um, the office accommodation is covered. Home accommodation is not. Okay. Um, I know because I've just been living, it's about 100 pounds a week to rent so um, So what's that? For a per fire, person or? Per person. So that's kind of 15, let's call it 1500 pounds. That would be five grand what we said, spent on rent mm -hmm. uh, during the program. Um, you won't have a life, so you won't spend any other money. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> you, you the only thing that you'll have in your phone is the pizza. Yeah, I was just asking because in the valley it costs something like 3000 per person. Yeah, it's a, it's a massive sum of money. <coughs> so, uh, and the other part is because A, of the university that we're in as part of the system, and B, because it's a university time, actually the accommodation is relatively easy to get hold of. What I tend to try and do is get big houses. So, so teams that actually, there'll be typically two or three teams in a house at the same time. So you really get sick and tired of looking at everybody else. <laughs> But it, it creates a whole dynamic because sometimes you go home and you don't work, but actually there's always something to talk to. Thanks. Uh, for instance, if there are three uh, team members and uh, one of them can't make it to the program, can you work uh, remotely with that person or does he have to be there? Depends how sexy the business is. What? Depends how sexy the business is. <laughs> this, in a perfect, what you'll actually find is typically two will start and the third one will join because they know they're missing out. Because actually, if you think about it, I mean, it sounds like a long time three, three months or 13 weeks but it actually goes past so quickly. Yeah, uh, I mean, from your point of view, from the organizer's point of view, um, we will make that decision depending on the team. Yeah, so in some instances, we got people who've got six people in the team. Yeah, we don't make up six people. So we'll take two or three. If you've got a three-person team, in reality, it's really strange having that spare thing kind of on the side. Yeah, and actually, that's what happens. That's what I'm saying. What actually practically happens is they typically pack the bags and say, you're having all the fun. Can we come too? Okay. What kind of people are you looking for into getting their pictures or photos? Sorry, you will not ask me again? Uh, what kind of people are you looking for to get the pictures? The ones who can talk with the investors and present ideas and stuff like that? Or even coders that can work there and present the product there? And so are you saying in terms of... So if, if, teams? Your, if your team is split into persons that sell the product and yeah. persons that actually 
build it, code it. Yeah. What kind of people would you like to see in Cambridge from that team? In yeah, perfect world, I think. <laughs> um, in a practical sense, the business side of the world. Um, interesting, you talk about pitching. I have this really weird thing. I like taking pitching, not business development people. Because business development people are far too smooth. Yeah. They can make smooth and they go, oh, my God. And they're very salesy. Yeah. And actually, one of the things that I think is really important <coughs> is if you can get somebody who's genuinely really passionate about the product, it's a really compelling pitch when somebody presents. And actually, one of my teams, the CT, there's kind of a couple of guys who found it. One was the CEO, one was the CTO. And the CTO happened to be there on the first day. And he said, Oh, I did a pitch now, but my CEO was going to do the pitch later at the end of the program. And he ended up, the CTO ended up doing the pitch at the end because actually he was, he was fantastic. Because he was so, he was the one that actually started the business and then the CEO joined him. But he was so passionate about his product. And actually what happens is through 13 weeks, you meet so many different people about what you do, and you talk about it so much, you become actually really comfortable in talking about your product. And actually you can get so many questions and answers through the process, that actually if somebody throws you a question, you actually think, I've heard, I've heard that once, I've heard that a few times. But actually getting, finding the, the passion, so what investors do at this really early stage is they really interesting. I mean, the idea is important, but more often than not, the decision to invest or not is more balanced than the side of the people. So you've got to find the person who stands up at the front and goes, look at my product, it's fantastic. Really, really good. The best of the best. Yeah, but, but it's, it's interesting because the program gives you the confidence to actually stand up and talk about your product because you have to meet so many people. Um, the other thing which is interesting <coughs> is we create this false deadline at the end of 13 weeks, which is the investor day. And we put you under massive amounts of pressure to be able to pitch and describe and articulate your project. But what happens is actually beyond the program itself. So you bluntly, at the end of 13 weeks, I go, I'm going to find some more teams. Now, you build yourself into a network, and I'm always there on the phone, so don't feel that I'm not there. But there's nothing really at the end of the program apart from. Right, we've given you everything we practically give you in 13 weeks. Get the fuck out of here and start running a business. Yeah? But being prepared to sell to those investors in week 13 creates this massive opportunity for your ability to go and do networking events or meet customers or partners. It's actually really become really comfortable with it. And actually, whilst it's for the deadline, Europeans are really bad at explaining the projects. Terrible. Americans are pretty cool at it, but they can't get into this 30 second elevator pitch. But they're very much high, my name is. Europeans are, you start talking to them, and then 20 minutes later, you go, I still don't know what the fuck you do. <laughs> and, and on this, you, you might have the best, this is a really frustrating part from my perspective as a DC, so you might have the best business in the world, but if you can't explain it, there's no point in it. So it's kind of, it's a bit false, but it's actually really valuable. Also, a question about colors. Mm -hmm. Suppose you have a great idea, yeah. but and you have a team that can code it. But in order to make it, I don't know, international, wide, yeah. scale, you need more experienced coders. Yeah. That's the, let's say, the hub you provide there. Does it help you with that? Um, you have, I can't help you with the other person that you start with, but the general nature. So no, but the question is actually more sensible. I get lots of, I got this great idea, but I don't know how to code it, and I go, no, my problem, we'll find somebody else. Go to a launch for you again, or go to a startup for you, find some coders. That's, the statement's actually less to do with coders and other people. So it might be coders, it might be deaf people, it might be sales people, it could be whatever. The way we build you into the network, we can give you all of the resources. In terms of, you need somebody? No. You actually have less of a problem, because you already have pre-existing links back to here. So I just had one of my mentors say, we need a PHP program. Anybody who wants to do PHP for a really cool startup in London, contact me. 
Um, and I've basically introduced you to a whole bunch of people across Eastern Europe. So you actually you have an advantage, ironically, over UK businesses. Because you have access to a much wider, highly skilled, cheaper talent, talent codes. So actually, when you look at businesses here, I kind of see some similar to what happened with Uber View, which is to kind of keep the core developer base here and actually create a business arm which sits in the UK. I actually have two questions. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, one regarding the timeline, and I can't really speak, but I will try. Uh, one regarding the timeline, and the other one uh, regarding the conditions for the team. So let me review a little your presentation. So you're um, basically offering a huge, uh, amazing network of mentors, uh, business angels, uh, VCs, like an octopus, um, with um, fifteen hundred pound expenses per month. Yes. Well, it's low. Well, to keep a roof over your head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We could buy you a tent if you want. <laughs> <laughs> we could get that cost bit spun even further. <laughs> Whatever. Um, okay. <laughs> She's just getting the facts. I know. <laughs> I'm just trying I'm to. Play. I'm teasing. I'm just trying to utter some words here. Okay. <sighs> I hope I'll, I'll even manage. Okay, so um, and five thousand pounds per month or for the program. For the program, okay. So if you have a two founder business, we can be ten thousand pounds. If you have three founders or more, we can be fifteen. But we do take six percent of Okay, the and um, and the timeline. So this three month three month or yeah. okay. starting in May. In May, so May, um, June, July. So that's that the fixed schedule, like starting with May. Yeah. No other no three months. Watch this space. Okay, okay. Um, and uh, um, what are the conditions for my team? Or for our team? Or what are the conditions? Yeah. Uh, to be accepted, of course. That's kind of it. It's really not that complicated. We just kind of we basically give you some money and say, would you like to come to the UK? You hang out for 13 weeks with really cool people. We lock the door and you're not allowed out. We push pizzas under the door every <laughs> spot. It's like feeding the animals. There's a few beers involved. Mm -hmm. And we basically try to, what, what we're effectively trying to do is imagine what it's like to build a business and what it would take to take your business forward in the next 12 months in a perfect world. But we can't compress it into three months. And the way we do that is by basically building you into this like hyper-connected network. And people are going to give you guidance, feedback, and they're going to give you introductions, contacts that they already know. And because those contacts and introductions come through a trusted party, what actually happens is you get meetings with people like the week after as opposed to them AI being ignored or them saying, I've got some spare time in about two months' time. And actually that trust relationship is actually what makes the whole thing work. That makes sense? Yeah. What's the involvement of the mentors, panels? So <coughs> they can have like an introduction day and everybody gets to know each other or are they going to be there uh, So we have kind of different dynamics. Um, mentors, we aim to try and probably push between 75 and 100 mentors past you in the first four weeks. And you always meet mentors on a one to one basis. <coughs> so I don't do, you sit in a room with three mentors. It doesn't work. Yeah. But you do speed dating, which you were kind enough to come and help out with last week. And speed dating is, in a day, there will be 10 mentors, 20 minute sessions each. And it's all about feedback. So what happens is at the end of the day, you, your head melts because you can all yeah. this advice. Well, even for the mentors as well. Um, but it's all about trying to get some feedback around your products, your business uh, ideas about what you can and can't do. So that's the kind of the initial part. What then practically happens is, and, and kind of stepping back from that. Through the first couple of days of the program, I actually teach my teams how to deal with mentors. So how to get the most out of them, what you should be asking them for, 
Um, I also bring in teams that have done programs like this before. So people who've been on the different teams and will come back and teach the teams starting. So it's the classic. If I knew what I knew at the end of the program and the start of the program, I could have done the program much better. So we kind of spend our life trying to accelerate the whole process. Um, so we actually teach people how to deal with the mentors. I can teach the teams, I can't teach the mentors. Yeah. There's too many of them and a lot of fucking big egos. Yeah. Um, what do we then do is in the second part of the program, month two and month three, a number of those mentors will start to engage with the teams on a regular basis. So typically a mentor will speak to you once a week. And we do things to encourage mentors to help. Yeah. So we start with, I guess, 75 to 100 mentors. By the time you get to the back end of the program, there'll typically be still 30 mentors involved. Yeah. So typically a team will have two, three, four mentors helping them through the duration of the program. And I talk about, it's imagine having um, a board meal once a week. Um, they effectively act as non execs. So once a week, I basically get my teams to prepare single pages, send it to the mentors to say, this is what we've done next week, this is what we're doing next week, these are the problems that we have, and this is the things that we can't figure out what we need to be doing. And you actually have a board meeting once a week. I mean, this is all variant, but this is an example. And so, all about getting them all on a conference call and telling them where you're at, what you need to do next week, how are we going to do that, does anybody know anybody? So effectively there to do that. So that's kind of the bare minimum that I ask of my mentors. Actually, I have mentors who I just can't keep out of the building. Yeah. Seriously, I've got, I've got one mentor particularly in the different side. I just does not have anything else in his life. I can't think out of the room, but it's great. The team he's working with, he just spends all his time there. At the end of the program, typically what happens is the big thing's a big like big safety net. And it's complete commercial free. So none of the mentors can charge you. They can't say, and I'll have five percent of you. The end of the program, what practically happens is the handcuffs come off. So at that point, you might be working with a mentor and say, you know what, he really did help. I mean, if he's done that in 13 weeks, what can he do going forward? And you might come to a commercial arrangement at that point. But you don't have to. But you actually get 13 weeks to play with mentors, so to speak, to actually work out whether there's somebody you want to work with. And vice versa, the mentors get to play with the teams so they can work out whether they're a team that they want to work with going forward. So it kind of starts with this kind of massive wall of noise. I call it deep. Yeah. You get this massive amount of feedback. And then you start to engage with some of the mentors through the rest of the program to help give you the guidance, the contacts, give you the advice that you need to, to try and build a business around. Right. <coughs> Um, I'm guessing, I don't know, I've never done spring board before. I'm guessing probably between 100 and 200. So, the reason why we only take more teams is typically teams are two people or three people. So, I describe <coughs> my average team size is two and a half people. I've never met a half person yet. <laughs> but that basically means there's 25 people in a room. And there's kind of some strange management speak, which basically says, actually, we need to put 25 people in a room, they work together. As soon as you get above 30, what happens is the group fragments mm -hmm. into half. And you end up with kind of people on that side of the room and people somewhere else. So, so 25 is actually a really nice sweet spot in terms of it being big enough that you don't get on top of each other, but not so big that everybody knows everybody else. That was coincidental. Any other questions? Yes? No? Or are you just <laughs> waving at me? Um, do you think you need special preparation for this? Like, this means like entering a survival show. Like, your life as you know it will end. And I, I cannot even after some bloody world. Yeah. Uh, we, assume, we assume nothing. We don't expect people to prepare for it. Um, because People, different people are in different places doing different things. So it's not, I mean, I basically say keep coding. Yeah. The more you get done, so I talk about, I can help you move your business forward by number. Let's call it three times. It could be three, it could be four, it could be whatever. But 
the more you start with, the further ahead you will jump at the end of the program. So interestingly, one of my best teams last time, which has raised three quarters of a million pounds, actually started in the this is part. But he didn't know which market and how to take it to market. So all he did was for 13 weeks, he didn't <coughs> build it. He coded it just to kind of, for fun. But he didn't need to build any more of the product. What he was more interested in doing is, how do I get to market? What are the markets I need to get to? And basically sitting in rooms with mentors and going, who do you know in this space? And they go, oh, these people. So can I be our introduction? Yeah. So the more you start with, the further you can actually get in the process. So I just say to my team, just keep going. Don't stop. Okay then, so I think we will apply, uh, we have the team, yeah. and um, the perfect number of members. Two and a half. <laughs> Are you the half, or is there something else? <laughs> no, yeah. That was so <laughs> Yes, I think we would um, apply, uh, maybe just for fun, or maybe because I just love risk, and yeah. love to change my life on the so. Thank you. Thank you. Is that it? So, are there, sorry, <laughs> are there any other obligations on the part of the teams besides the fact that you give you they give you six percent of their business to get there? We we might, depending upon where people come from, we might say set up a UK company, a little best in a UK company, um, and in this instance, a Romanian company may end up being a subsidiary of the UK. Yeah, that's actually a good subject. Uh, are you going to help with incorporation? Um, that would be probably the only straight thing, and, and that's on a case by case basis. So, depending upon where teams are coming from, so no offense, but if you're looking at investment from the UK, they're not going to invest directly into people making them. And also, the time to do that is about <coughs> cost about 20 quid to start up a UK company, and it'll probably take about 24 hours for that to happen. So, it's not hard work to make those things. Uh, any legal help? So what we have is we've got lawyers engaged who will help that, and we've also got accountants engaged um, who will help with all of the taxes on the other side. So sort of out if you need to employ yourself, if you have to pay tax. So I don't have a line of it. Actually, but what I do practically is I just invite one accounting firm in to do all of that stuff, and they just work with everybody. Uh, lawyers, we typically have. I've got three sets of lawyers involved. So there's one from Cambridge and two from London. So let's say you go there as a company mm -hmm. and you meet your agent in the first week and you both agree that he's your agent and you're the company for it. Do you have to spend the rest of 12 weeks there or you can just go and... What I do is I share time at that point. So don't be a fucking idiot. <laughs> because actually if you've persuaded an angel in the first week, imagine how many you want to persuade by week 13. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's called competition. I know it doesn't exist in Europe, <coughs> but what's hap what actually practically happens is most angels will not commit themselves because they don't have to. They basically say, actually, that's really cool, and I actually can see angels doing that, but I'm going to kind of keep an eye on you for the 13 weeks. And what they do is they be really nice to you for the 13 weeks. <coughs> what they're trying to persuade you is they're the person you want to take investment from. So one of the really interesting things is my angels who have funded the whole program have no preferential rights to investing in you after the program, which is really weird. Because most angels go, well, we put the money up front, so when we get to the end, we get the first bit. Yeah. The problem with that is if other investors think that they have preferential rights, what will happen is they'll go, well, you get the good stuff and we get the shit. Yeah. So what my angels have agreed is that it's completely open play. In real terms, what it actually means is when you sign the documentation initially, my angels' names will be on your share registry. And those angels will work with you for 13 weeks. So if you actually talk to an angel on a daily basis, and somebody randomly turns up on an investor day and says, here's some money, and an angel makes a similar offer, who do you think you want to take money from? So, and I'm known for somebody to be more than 13 weeks. So there's a kind of an emotional connection that it happens in the process rather than it being, it's just money, especially in Yeah. Speaking of legal, if you're investing 
contracts with the following members? Yeah. Too hard. Okay. We could, but, but what happens is we can't do a lot of stuff on the fly. We can't make it as we go along. Because actually, we don't know. Some of these businesses are going to do this program and go, yeah. And some of them are going to go, but actually, what happens is some of the teams that go that way will suddenly get a whole bunch of money and will fix a whole bunch of stuff retrospectively. There's no point in spending too much time up front on something that may or may not work. So, a really good example, and the reason why I talk about that is one of the teams that I've seen on the tech stars. They basically said, we've invested in you in a UK company. We don't like it, but we'll do it anyway. Um, but if you actually go on and raise money, we'll get you moved to Delaware and we'll sort all that stuff out. And that guy went on to raise $1.2 million. So when you've got the money in the bank, you can fix a lot of those things. So you <coughs> might not impose things on you, but your next round of funding may come in and say, investing is important. Yeah? There's no point in me predicting what that may or may not be. Our contracts are really light. The only thing that's a bit strange is we don't let you sell the IP at the end of the process, out of your business. So the big thing I have is you build this product, you get all of this hype, <coughs> and then the, the, the period, what happens is you sell it to a new company. Okay. I go, you can't do that. Because if you try and sell the business to shares, I can get shares, I can get money from shares. But it's just more to stop that moving the IP into somewhere straight. That's the only thing that's a bit weird. Any more? What about the pitches afterwards? Do they happen? Do they happen? <laughs> That's my question. Oh, everyone gets the pitch to the unless they really upset me. Um, what practically happens is sometimes teams will turn up and they won't have the labels done. Because it's, it's really, it gets really hard to get all the right things in the right place. So in that instance, you don't get your money. You can do the program, but you don't get your money until you sign the legal. <coughs> and, and I had a team last time around who actually signed their legals the day before investment bank. Because I said I wouldn't let them stand up and do the pitch unless they'd finished off the legal documentation, which I thought 13 weeks later was a reasonable thing to ask. But everybody gets the pitch. I don't bar people from it. Is that, is that what you mean? So if I start with 10 teams, 10 teams will pitch. No, like two times, what the announcement for today's meeting was, it was, no, he meant whether there are going to be any pitches. If you want to. You don't have to stand up, you can sit down and talk to me. I don't know what the arrangement is today. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I got to ask you about the pitches after the first and we agree. Everybody gets the pitch. Mm -hmm. And everybody gets a king for 13 weeks. That would be ready to pitch on the process. Mm -hmm. This is in a nice way to give you a kick. That would be very close. Yeah, that's, this is a really good example. So my, the person that I use uses this example, which is if somebody woke you up at 3 o'clock in the morning, <coughs> you would be able to sit up right and go, Hi, my name's John, I'm from Springboard. <laughs> yeah? Not in a robotic sense, but being able to pitch anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I have this thing, which is, I go to some pitch events, and one of the people typically on the pitch event is, I didn't know what was going on today, <laughs> but I thought I'd kind of come up here and stand and pitch to you. And they ramble for 10 minutes with no slides. My big thing is, you should be always prepared. You never know who you're going to meet, when they're going to meet. And you can either be standing up doing a pitch, like today, and you always should have a deck available to be able to do a pitch. And where you should be able to, in two or three minutes, be able to quickly explain what you do. Mm -hmm. So, I don't see it as a, I see it as a life skill, rather than a, mm -hmm. it's an event, you just do it there. You do it all the time. Because one of the big things that you have, in theory, is passion. The one thing you don't have is money. <laughs> but actually, when you're at your level, Passion is much, much more important than money. So, so you need money to live. Passion doesn't really feed you in the morning. So let's get over that bit. 
Passion is really interesting because money is really strange. Money typically is somebody else has it and you don't. Yeah? So you have to ask somebody's permission. And when you take the money, they normally say, and these are the rules, the conditions for taking money. Passion. You don't have to ask somebody for it. Yeah? You have it. And actually, you know what? You don't have to ask somebody's permission to have passion. The other thing is money is finite. Which is, you typically say there's 10 pounds. Once you spend 10 pounds, it's gone. Passion is something which you A, you have, but it's infinite. You get up today and you're passionate about your product. You get up tomorrow and you're passionate about your product. So there's no kind of limit to how much that is. And the last bit, which I think is the most important <coughs> thing to think about, is money's not viral. That's in three strange. But if I give you 10 pounds, yeah, you'll feel pretty good about that. Yeah? But you're not, because you'll be fucked off that I've given him the money, not you. Yeah? And it kills you as well. But if you're really passionate about what you do, and I talk to you about Springboard, yeah? you're more likely to speak to somebody else. Go, oh, this is really cool, good that turned out really good. But he wasn't too bad. You should really look at Springboard. It's actually infectious. And that's the thing that I see a lot of. When I talk to people, they'll say, I met a startup the other day. I just really cool what she made. So passion has this viral element. And I think people in Europe become too fixated about money. Mm -hmm. and they end up finding that there isn't any. And any picture went about to and then you get over it. And they start building stuff. So get over it for quickly and just start building stuff. And be genuinely really passionate about what you do. It's, it's such an infectious thing. It's a great way to actually sell you, sell your products, sell your business. So let's say you get there, you get to Cambridge. Yeah. And uh, you, owe, you owe 6% of my company at yeah. this time. And nothing gets out of there. You turn out to be, actually me as a company, I turn out to be a big disappointment for you and nothing ever happens from me being there. Uh, can I get those percent back from you, let's say in three or six months if nothing happened, but if I perhaps want to have a spin off or something else and want to... That's negotiable. So, sorry, if, if you do the program and you think you got something and we end up there 13 weeks going, well that's stupid, that's never going to work, yeah? Shit happens. It's not big. I can take 10 teams. And I will expect a number of those teams that, well, actually, what practically happens is most teams pivot like crazy, like on a daily basis. <coughs> they kind of go, we went and saw some mentors, and they said, oh, shit, so we'll think of something different. How can we do this different? And you get to the next day, and you start pitching something different. And you end up finding, it's, that's, that's one of the big advantages of having this massive number of people initially. You end up can actually play silly games. So I tell my teams to play silly games through the program. Which is, so there's two things that happen. When you pitch a product, and this is applicable any life scenario versus my program. When you're pitching your thing, this is typically what I call a oh yeah moment in the conversation. And what will happen is somebody you're pitching to will suddenly go, Oh, I know what you're doing. <coughs> one of them. And what you do is you mentally stop and rewind the conversation 30 seconds and figure out what the fuck you said 30 seconds earlier for them to go, oh yeah, one of them. So what you say is the next time you pitch the product, you try to get to that oh yeah moment faster. So my 20 minutes, I typically, the first day, the teams pitch for 20 minutes and they still can't explain themselves. And the mentors, you can't go to them and say, what feedback did you get? And they go, we didn't get it. Why? Because <coughs> we talked for 20 minutes. Yeah? If you're talking, you don't get feedback. So what we try to do is change that dynamic. It's not as bad as that's typically 15 minutes of pitching and then 5 minutes of advice. But you actually get better very, very quickly at pitching your business. And typically you can get it quite easily done in 5 minutes and then get 15 minutes of feedback, which is the perfect scenario. Um, I can't remember what the solving question was. What was the question? Who asked me the question? I asked you the question. The question was... So, so, yeah. What if I fail? 
if you fail, it's not good. Don't care. We're not likely to sell our stick six or nine months after the business. Yeah. We typically can't give you 12 months. And if something happens, what's more likely to happen is you're more likely to say the same thing don't work and we just shut the business down. Um, <coughs> so we work on a long term basis with those things. But it's, we, we, the whole model is based around 10. And some work makes some more work. Something the some idea failed, some project failed. Is it possible to uh, start a new one to change it in, uh, to change it, maybe even start a new one? Absolutely. That, uh, we we expect people to want to start with and what they end up with, but we're not like two different things. They might be in the same sort of area, mm -hmm. but they might be pointing in different directions. Um, and that's the big reason. So one of the big things that we find because the way seed camp is set up is this whole big thing, which is when you win it, people make a big announcement about their property <coughs> the business. We actually don't really do that. Because the problem is if you go on the first day and say, is that a great product? I know it's not going to be like that at the end of the program. So there's no point in trying to sell apples when you get to the end of the program, it's oranges. So this is a really weird thing. If you think about it, when white combinator do stuff, tech stars do stuff, they don't talk about the teams when they start, they talk about them on the end. Because you get that, when you pitch your pitch, <coughs> you don't know exactly what the hell you're pitching, and save your, your power, so to speak, to the end of the program. So actually the most important thing for you is uh, me? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, people, people, people. <coughs> yeah? But so, the product would be interesting if it makes the same money. Medium too, and then maybe it's, uh, it implies that also the team is really good. Yeah. But if you don't have anything, the people are really good. Yeah. Typically, typically um, good teams tend to have reasonably good ideas. I might, I might look at an idea and go, that's sort of interesting and it's a really cool space. And it's not quite what I would do, but we can do something with it for a time. Um, so I always give this example, being free to use it elsewhere. So two options, good team, bad idea, or bad, good, bad yeah. idea, sorry. Would they get yeah. Good team, bad idea, <coughs> bad team, good idea, yeah? We will never touch this side. So a good team will recognize a bad idea and change it. Yeah? Chances of a bad team executing on a good idea, especially at a very early stage, are nil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's why we always get fixated on teams. So when if you do an application, that's the bit that I will always spend a lot of time on. So I'm interested in looking at people who've done stuff. I'm interested in understanding where you're at, how committed you are to the process. Um, show me something you've done in the past. It doesn't have to be a success in terms of commercial, but show me you're a doer. That's what I'm interested in. People who are tinkering or getting stuck into stuff or selling their mom's furniture when they're 13, yeah? Because they can make a few quid on them. Yeah, whatever. But, but <coughs> if you can kind of show a passion for what you've done and a, a knowledge of the subject area, or you've done stuff historically for somebody else, or you've built some cool open source project or something. That's the bit. So I'm really interested in digging into the teams. And the idea is interesting, but the more important part we always look to is
But it, it's, the notion I hear is it's meant to be a self-help process for you. The idea is that you don't suddenly become dependent on me or other people in the process. What we're trying to do is give you everything that you possibly need through the three months and make sure that you're independent. So one of the big things is teams will typically come to me, well, we've got a problem, you do this or this, yeah? And all they want me to say is which one to pick. But I will never tell them which one to pick. Because at the end of the day, it's your business. It's your responsibility for what happens in it. I can help and I can give you as much advice as I can. But ultimately, decisions that happen during the program are the people who own the business, not the mentors. So the mentors are there to seek advice from. But at the end of the day, it's your business. Because what we want to do is ensure that on week 13, day plus one, you're still confident enough to go on and build your business. We don't, it can kill a business if we are, we're doing this stuff for you. Because at the end of the program, what happens is you suddenly go to and there's nobody there. And it's up to you to still drive the business forward. Any more? Cool. Um, I'm around all day. I don't know what the plans are. Okay, so uh, thank you, John, for coming. And, uh, thank you for the